My name is Todd Sunstead. Uh, I have uh, I work for a company that does uh, some of the stuff related to this. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, some specific varieties of artificial intelligence, um, and uh, I'll, I'll dive into that in a little more detail and give you a little more background about myself as well. But uh, that's kind of the quick overview. All right, good to go. Coffee and everything's ready. If uh, you can't hear me, somebody let me know in the back. Uh, I'll try to move closer, talk a little bit louder. So uh, the talk, just uh, very quickly to give a sense of things, uh, kind of naturally breaks into two parts. Uh, and so if uh, everybody here is okay, uh, I will do some questions after the first part and then save time for some questions after the second part. Uh, I think it'll make sense uh, once we get to those pieces. So if you've got some thoughts for questions, uh, please uh, don't hesitate. Uh, to write them down and, and be ready to ask them. Uh, once again, I had, uh, I, I've had actually been involved. We're going to be talking primarily about a particular type of artificial intelligence called uh, neural networks, which is something that I had done uh, in the early, eight, or early 90s uh, in graduate school and then watched it fall out of fashion uh, and then got excited again in about uh, 2012, 2013, 2014 when it started to appear uh, on the scene again. Uh, it's actually pretty hard to avoid now. This is a piece of news that popped up probably on Hacker News uh, earlier this week. Um, it's it's an interesting article. Uh, ironically, I guess, it's uh, talking about uh, concerns over fake news uh, from a company that uh, 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 kind of created the clickbait headline. So I guess morally I'm not sure how concerned I am about this particular article. But the, the point is, uh, you know, this is, you don't have to throw a rock very far to hit uh, some news about artificial intelligence, the misuse of artificial intelligence, uh, the use of artificial intelligence to create deep fakes. Uh, you know, there's the, the number of issues that circle around this particular topic is huge. What I want to talk about, about this time is, is something that I'm loosely calling weaknesses in artificial intelligence. If you're in uh, the security field, uh, I'll apologize in advance, uh, or if you're interested in security, I'm not trying to stick tightly to any particular nomenclature here for the things I'm about to describe. I, I wanted to err on the side of maybe picking things that people would, uh, t labels that people would understand uh, versus trying to be technically correct about these things. So I'm just gonna call these roughly speaking security weaknesses, uh, and then we're gonna talk about two different types of those. So I'm breaking them down roughly into two groups, uh, this kind of notion around fakes. Uh, and I think uh, people that have uh, been paying attention to the news uh, over the last year will know what I'm talking about. Uh, but this is really a case where the technology is fine, right? The threat is not a result in the, on a weakness in the technology. Uh, it's really a, a problem that comes about because people are using this technology in a way that the designers or uh, the creators probably didn't intend it to be used. And I'll talk a little bit more with, about that, what that means with some examples in a moment. Uh, and then the other thing I want to talk about is something I'm calling roughly an attack. Uh, and this is actually uh, uh, a problem, a, a threat that's the result of an actual weakness in the technology itself, a weakness in its design, a weakness in its implementation, uh, and that's allowing people to use it in ways that weren't intended. And once again, these aren't official categories at all, but I thought it was a nice way to kind of break this down uh, to hit a couple of things that I think are very interesting uh, uh, or maybe you're worrying about what's going on right now in this particular field. Uh, and then just to give everyone a sense of where I'm going to go with this before I start diving in and talking, uh, kind of on the fake side, I'm going to talk about the generation of something called deep fakes, uh, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. It involves typically putting a fa someone else's face uh, in a very photorealistic way uh, in a video on top of someone else's body. Uh, and then I'm also going to talk briefly about uh, the generation of fake reviews. Uh, and then on the attack side, I want to talk a little bit about image recognition for autonomous vehicles, because obviously this is a, a big area that is, is barreling down towards us very quickly. Uh, and then I want to talk about uh, some issues with voice recognition in uh, virtual assistants, which is also given the millions of these devices that are now sitting around in people's homes, uh, potentially an issue as well. Uh, but, but, and, and I guess too, the other, the th other thing I'll do is uh, as I'm talking about these, I'll dive a little bit into uh, kind of the level of threat that they represent. Uh, so one of the things that I want to do is give everyone some kind of quantitative sense of how difficult some of these particular attacks would be to pull off uh, if you were motivated to do so. 
Uh, so, but before we jump into this, I want to play a little game called Name the Celebrity. All right, any guesses? Anyone? Almost. There, it's, it's, it's even better than that. So they look very close, right? They look like, uh, I would say they look like legitimate individuals. Uh, in fact, none of these are people, and they're not even really blends. I mean, they are in the loosest sense. Uh, they're actually generated faces. So there's a particular type of neural network called a GAN, uh, which stands for a generative uh, uh, adversarial network. Uh, and, and, and you actually train this network on, in this particular case, thousands and thousands uh, faces of celebrities because you've got lots of pictures of their faces. Uh, and then you actually use it to generate novel faces. And, and if you look at this, this is amazing. Uh, you can now kind of tell if you start to look and go, well, you know, when I look at the head there, maybe, or the hat, it doesn't quite look as photorealistic as it would, uh, although the face itself is pretty good. You know, the ears are a little bit off. Uh, but basically, these are completely generated by a neural network. Now, the reason I bring this up is to make a point. So, so as I dive through this, there's kind of the superficial point of this talk, which is about these security weaknesses. But there are a couple of take-home things that I wanted everyone to be aware of that I think are actually really the issues here that, that uh, you should uh, kind of try to remember. And the first one of these is that AI is getting better really fast. Uh, and by this, so I'm now taking a look at these generative adversarial networks, these GANs, over the last four years or so, and showing you how fast the quality of these images has improved uh, literally over four years. Okay, so next year, if you're thinking about this stuff, I can almost guarantee this is going to look rinky-dink and we'll be on to something crazy uh, beyond this point. So the, the first take-home point is, this is artificial intelligence is getting better fast, and it's getting better fast for a specific reason. It's getting better fast because the amount of compute power we are throwing at training neural networks is moving faster than you can imagine. So the, the kind of the current revolution in neural networks started around 2012, uh, which is only six years ago. In that six years, the amount of compute power people are throwing at training neural networks has gone up 300,000 times, uh, which roughly is a doubling factor of every three and a half months. Uh, by comparison, Moore's law, which if you're kind of interested in hardware, uh, this is kind of the law that governs uh, hardware speed up improvements doubles every 18 months. Uh, and there's a very tight correlation between the amount of compute you're willing to throw at a problem and the quality of the results you can get. Uh, the authors of this work right here even point out that, you know, if this trend continues, you just expect that the type of things people are doing with neural networks to change dramatically uh, really every year. So anyway, this is the first kind of take home point that I just wanted to kind of give everyone before we dive in, which is artificial intelligence is getting better fast. So with that said, let's talk about fakes and let's take a little break for a movie. There is, a, uh, audio is probably not super important for this particular one. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I would guess most of you are aware of this. So the interesting thing about this, so this is kind of the essence of a deep fake right here, right? Uh, so uh, with all due respect to Nicolas Cage, I don't know why the poor guy got picked out for this. I actually like Nicolas Cage. I, I think he's got a very distinctive face. And so the essence of a deep fake basically is taking someone else's image, their face, which is the piece of, of kind of the body that we recognize most automatically, and, and kind of manipulating it into a video on, on a other group, another group. Uh, typically you see these and they're done with one or two. I like this one because you've got it. This, this particular scene, like all the actors, they've kind of tried to merge this face into. And what's interesting about the deep fake thing, deep fakes thing, if you if you pay attention at all to uh, the the kind of the news about this, is the fact that it's easy to do, right? Um, and of course, the the use cases that people are making of it in terms of how they abuse this technology is also uh, newsworthy. 
but uh, I think it's the fact that this is easy that makes it so important. So this is kind of the first, uh, what I'm going to call you know, weakness, uh, the, the first fake that I want to talk about, because it kind of calls into question you know, how much we can believe uh, what we see. Uh, and going back to those celebrity images, you can get, uh, with enough data, you can get even a video uh, to look close enough that you're going to have a hard time distinguishing it from the real thing. So what I want to do now is talk a little bit about how, this, how, how deep fakes are made uh, at a very high level, uh, and then once again talk about kind of what the level of threat uh, this actually is in terms of pulling it off. So how does a deep fake work? Uh, I'm going to do this via analogy. So imagine that uh, you hire a artist and you ask that artist to, to look at you and then go into another room and draw a picture of you. Uh, so that artist looks at you for a while, goes into another room, draws a picture, comes out. You know, if they're good, it's going to look kind of like you. And then you say, okay, now look at the picture you drew, look at me again, and, and kind of think about it and then go into the room and, and do it again. Right? So every time they do this, this process, this iteration, they're going to get a little bit better at drawing your picture from memory. And what they're doing is actually building in their mind not a photorealistic picture of what you look like, because your face is going to be kind of at a different angle every time they look at you or whatever. They're building a model in their head of what you look like, look like and then they're going and, and creating a, a drawing of you uh, from that mental representation. And so that's really what's going on. Uh, with a deep fake, uh, except in the, in the case of a deep fake, you're replacing the artist, in this case, with a network called an autoencoder. Uh, and an autoencoder is really trying to do the same thing when you train it. Uh, it's composed of two parts, this encoder and this decoder part. Uh, and you show lots of images to the encoder, uh, and then it generates something that it thinks is the proper output, and you keep uh, cycling through these iterations, correcting its behavior until, in fact, it can generate your picture. Uh, and, and the way they typically do this, they try to distill it down. So it's not, it's not memorizing your picture. It's learning the salient features uh, of, your, of your image uh, as part of its representation internally. And so that is, is basically what's going on uh, with a deep fake with one uh, small modification. So let's say you wanted to actually do a deep fake. The difference here is that you break the network into two parts uh, and you train them slightly differently. So on the encoding side, let's say that for whatever crazy reason I wanted to put my face on Boromir's face in The Lord of the Rings, which I think would be awesome, uh, frankly, the long hair, whatever. Uh, so you, you train the neural network to recognize the face of Boromir uh, uh, or Sean Bean and my face, and you do that through thousands of images, and it actually learns kind of the common representation of these two faces. But on the decoding side, and this is literally exactly what's happening with the deep fake, on the decoding side, you train it to only be able to decode or create one type of face, which would be mine. So it doesn't know anything about Sean Bean's encoding, it simply knows my encoding for the face after it's been trained as well, and then you use it to encode the video. And at that point, more or less, when it encounters a face in that video of Sean Bean's and is asked to regenerate that scene, the only face it knows about is mine, and it puts that in. And that's literally what goes on when creating a deep fake. So the question is, what's required to do this? I think this is where it gets uh, kind of interesting. So the first thing that you need to do this is thousands of images. So one kind of uh, kind of caveat to the popularity of this technique is the fact that you've got to have a lot of images uh, in order to to uh, get the the training done, right? So if you've got a handful of images, it's not going to look good. You need them from a lot of different angles. This is why people are doing this with celebrities because lots and lots of photos are available from lots and lots of different angles angles in lots and lots of different lighting situations and whatever of celebrities so it's it's easier to do uh, you need the code now the code is available right now on github uh, you can go out and you can actually download this code it's it's there's not a lot of code it's probably a couple thousand lines maybe a thousand lines uh, on top of uh, you know a deep learning toolkit but you don't have to monkey with that right uh, it's not, I would say, uh, if you think about these things, it's not at the level of what I would call a script kitty tool yet. You've got to have a, a certain amount of uh, technical uh, fortitude to go through the trouble of doing all of this, but, it, but you don't actually have to understand much about the actual technology itself. Uh, and the cost? About 36 bucks. So 
if you want to build a rig uh, and, and install graphics cards in that, you'll spend a couple of hundred dollars, a couple thousand dollars, a couple hundred dollars per card, and maybe a couple thousand dollars for your rig. But if you want to do this on top of Amazon AWS on an EC2 instance with a couple of GPUs attached, uh, the training time, if you've got the images and you've got the code, is about will cost you about $36. Uh, so, you know, no one's probably going to build this into an iPhone app yet uh, because that's too expensive for, for something like that from an attack perspective uh, or a misuse perspective, but it really does uh, open the door to doing this uh, for, for, you know, without a lot of trouble. Uh, right now, probably the hurdle is data uh, and, and, you know, the technical skill you still need to, to kind of deal with an Amazon EC2 instance and set up something and get it working with uh, whatever your, your toolkit is. Now, it's interesting to note there are some novel applications of this uh, that maybe aren't quite so illegitimate. Uh, there's a company in Sweden uh, called Looklet, uh, which is essentially doing this for fashion. So what they're doing is they allow a company that's in the fashion business to put their clothes on a mannequin or a set of mannequins. Uh, you take pictures of that. They actually hire the models, uh, and then they do this transformation that I just described uh, onto those models. And so and it, it can adapt for pose, like it's just your clothes right there, uh, and it'll actually adapt the clothes to fit a particular pose uh, and do all of that automatically. So, you know, like a lot of things, uh, a lot of technology, there are some worrying components and maybe some, po uh, some things that aren't quite so worrying. Uh, and then kind of humorously, there's uh, some, some, some research group that's actually doing this uh, to generate uh, uh, anime faces because uh, I don't think there are enough anime faces, I guess, out there. So, so should we worry about this or not? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, photography, modern photography is only about 180 years old. Uh, so there's a huge chunk of human history in which we actually didn't expect the things we see to be images of a point in time, which is how we think about imagery right now. You know, so maybe, uh, in, in, you know, when we think about pictures, we can kind of unlearn this expectation and become a little bit uh, more critical of what we see uh, before immediately assuming it's, uh, you know, photorealistic. Uh, words have been with us a lot longer, uh, and so maybe uh, we should be more concerned about the generation of something like fake reviews. Uh, so this is an interesting review. It's, the food here is freaking amazing. The portions are great. The cheese bagel was cooked to perfection and well prepared, fresh and delicious. The service was fast. Our favorite spot for sure, we will be back. This could be any uh, review that you've probably ever seen on a site like Yelp, uh, but it's fake. Uh, and in fact, it wasn't generated by a human fake. It was generated by a machine. And so the next thing that I wanted to talk about uh, is the generation of fake reviews because, like I said, words have been with us a lot longer than photography. Uh, as it turns out, too, and I'll just kind of jump a, a little bit forward, it's actually a little harder to generate a good fake review, uh, ironically, than it is to generate a fake photo, uh, fake image of, of a face that doesn't even exist or to, uh, to put a face on someone. So I wanted to give you a sense of the kinds of reviews that this software was generating. Uh, so this is a group of negative reviews. Uh, if you jump on down, you know, do not waste your time and money. If you quickly scan these, the first thing I think you'll notice is, wow, these, you know, kind of look realistic. Um, I'll point out a couple of things that don't make so much sense. Uh, I was so disappointed that I was so disappointed in the f food uh, up at the top. Uh, I was there for a couple months. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you jump in, you know, it's, uh, you can, you, you can kind of tell, like, this, yeah, they don't quite sound right, right? Uh, and this, then, then my point is to kind of point out that once again, it's, it's hard to get these verbal descriptions, strangely enough, uh, good. Uh, here are some uh, more positive ones. The one I showed at the very beginning is there on the bottom. The food here was freaking amazing. But if you dig into these, you'll see some weird, uh, some weirdness as well. I will definitely be back and I will be back for sure. It's like, yeah, someone could have wrote that. Uh, you know, People get typing fast in these review sites, whatever. But you know, it doesn't sound exactly like, like what a human would 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 say in this case. Uh, the other thing too, just I'll, I'll say very quickly, I've tried to provide links to the research. Most of this research is within the last six to twelve months, uh, so it's actually very very recent in many cases. Some of it goes back a couple of years, and by a couple of years, I mean like 2016. 
uh, is probably the oldest link I think I have on here. Uh, at the very end, I'll provide a link to, uh, I have a Mastodon account that I use for my social media, uh, and I've posted uh, uh, kind of a reduced size PDF link, uh, link to a PDF there of this talk. Uh, as well as all of the links in here if anyone wants to dive in. Uh, so don't worry so much about grabbing these. Uh, you can get these online uh, right when the talk is done. Uh, but anyway, uh, I wanted to highlight this, and then I want to talk just a little bit about how this works. So when you're generating a fake review, uh, you, what you're doing is you're taking a look at kind of superficially at the distribution of, of letters and what follows what in a big pile of, of existing reviews. That's the basic technique. So they build this network, and over time, they pipe in a lot of, in, of data, and they realize that, ah, you know, if you got a T, you probably have an H after that, and if you have an H, you probably have an I, and if you get, get THI, the next thing is probably an S. Uh, and they build up a set of probabilities, because, of course, a TH can be followed by E, too, right? So they build up this kind of uh, set of probabilities around what follows what with a, with a neural network. Uh, so it's, once again, fairly simple uh, in terms of what's required to pull it off. Now, there's a particular challenge with this. So if you start with, say, 200,000 reviews from Yelp uh, and do this technique, you'll generate re you know, review-sounding things, uh, but it's not necessarily going to get the foods right. So for a sushi place, it would, might generate, you know, this is, uh, this is the best place. I love the tacos and especially the spaghetti. You know, if you're going to a sushi place, uh, and they're serving tacos and spaghetti, or you're looking it up on Yelp, you know, you're not probably going to buy it. Uh, so they do a, a secondary step where they take this generated uh, text, they identify the food words, and then they basically replace those with words that are more appropriate to that particular venue. And that's, that's it. That's the technique for generating these two reviews. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, these kind of reviews. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so what's required to do this? Uh, once again, you need data. Uh, in this case, you need more than thousands of images. You actually need, uh, for this particular bit of research, uh, over 200,000 reviews. Uh, the Yelp actually makes these available for research purposes on their site uh, because they want people to try to uh, build, either build tools to do this or build the fences against it, right, to help them uh, in what they're doing. So you can actually get these reviews without a lot of trouble, but you need the, a lot of reviews. You need the code. Uh, once again, you can go to GitHub right now and download the code necessary to do this. Uh, so you can get the data, you can get the code, and it's once again in about the $36 range if you want to uh, rent out some time on Amazon uh, EC2 instances with attached GPUs uh, and run this code uh, to, to replicate these results. So, you know, it's uh, the, the research actually was called... Uh, automated crowd turfing attacks. So crowd turfing is the hiring of uh, kind of low paid uh, people to sit and generate reviews by hand, uh, net positive or negative. And this is, uh, this research was in the automation of that using neural networks. Uh, so, you know, it's at 36 bucks, potentially uh, less expensive than hiring a, a legion of, of even poorly paid individuals to do this work. So that's the first half of this, uh, focused once again on fakes. Uh, what I want to do is spend maybe five minutes until the top of the hour uh, just taking a few questions if people have questions or want some clarification, uh, and then I'll move on into attacks. Go ahead. Did you mention uh, GPUs for both the reviews as well as the images? Yeah, yep. So the question was, uh, did I mention using GPUs for both uh, the, the fakes, the deep fakes and the reviews. Yeah, at this point, to do effective training, you pretty much are going to require some dedicated hardware. Uh, a GPU or set of GPUs is going to be fine for doing that. Uh, you can't do it effectively with the CPU uh, at this point in time. I mean, you can. You're just going to be waiting potentially weeks to do this versus maybe 24 hours or 72 hours, so it can make a big difference in the training time. Go ahead. In the early 90s, we had Forrest Gump, remember? And they simulated he was at the, you know, the, the water gate. And, and then with, what, was that the rudimentary beginning to this, more or less? Well, so, so that, that's actually a really good question. This is about uh, kind of the uh, things leading up, and up to this. So nothing that, they, that we've done that's been done with deep fakes is not something you couldn't do with dedicated video editing professionals, right? 
Uh, the difference isn't so much in what you can accomplish because a great team of people with the right technology can absolutely build very convincing videos in exactly the fashion. The, the risk here, and I think the common risk with a lot of these technological advancements, is the fact that it, it really lowers the boundary to doing this, right? The fact that you can take someone with a moderate amount, and it's not really t even technical skill, it's just a certain amount of tenacity, right? You've got to get in there, read the Amazon docs, create an account, fill around with setting up an you know, image or getting an EC2 image and connecting all, like it, it just takes tenacity more than, than you know, like an engineering degree. And so it becomes very easy to do these things and I think that's the real risk. Uh, could you speak a little towards the black box nature of all this? Because uh, probably in this room there are folks that seem, might think that there's this algorithmic mapping that's happening here whereas it's really just, okay, magic. <laughs> so, so that actually leads very well into something that I'm going to talk about just in a moment. You're welcome. Uh, so, yeah. So I'm going to hold off there. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm just going to, I think I'm going to address this in a moment here uh, with my kind of my next takeaway point. Uh, one more if we've got, to, if anyone's got anything. I think she's sending the, ah, that's the advantage of the throwable mic. I like that. Um, so... As a younger man who hasn't really been around for artificial intelligence as much, oh, it's a microphone? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I was thinking about the fake reviews some, and I also remember reading an article published by Google, uh, and also talking about training, but there is an implicit information that I believe artificial, can't, artificial intelligence can't handle. So like, I remember Google was talking in um, an article they released that a phrase like, Kelly is talking on her phone, driving down the road in the middle of her car, is the, the algorithm when it reads that can't tell, is Kelly talking in the, on her phone in the middle of her car, or is she driving on a road which is placed in the middle of her car? Where the human brain is good at interpreting implicit information, do you see studies happening that are going through implicit information at all to improve networks? Yeah, I think people are definitely aware. Researchers are very definitely aware of the challenges there. So the question is around, I think, context. And in fact, it's a great lead into to this next section because I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of context. We bring a lot uh, of tools to bear in trying to understand a scene. I mean, I'm looking at, at this, and really from where I'm sitting, you all might as well be kind of two-dimensional, right? It's far enough away that, you know, maybe if I sh switch eyes, there's a slight depth. Uh, thing, but by the time we're talking about the back, I'm looking at something that's two-dimensional, but I have a lot of context, right? I know that I'm in a conference room. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about this in a minute, but I don't expect to see a train in here, right? Uh, so we can bring a lot of knowledge to a problem beyond just kind of the two-dimensional pixels, uh, and that's when we talk about attacks, actually where a lot of these tax, uh, attacks find their home right now is in dealing, is in is in uh, taking advantage of the fact that neural networks can do some things extraordinarily well, but don't necessarily have all the tools we would have in order to decipher a scene. And that's a big deal when we talk about autonomous vehicles, for instance. So we're definitely going to talk about that in a sec. All right, Real I'm quick, gonna if anybody's got a seat next to them, if you all want to raise your hand, because there are some people without seats, if you all would like to sit down. Thank you. All right, so the second, this is the best audience I've ever had, too. I'm just enjoying looking out at the front row here. We've got the Incredibles. We've got data. Uh, this is amazing. Uh, the, uh, so the second thing that I wanted to kind of give everyone for kind of the big takeaway from this, right, is that maybe the best way to interpret the letters AI is not uh, artificial intelligence, but to think about it as an alien intelligence. Uh, they can definitely learn, right? Uh, I think by any reasonable definition of learning, the thing that's, things that are going on when you train a neural network is learning. Uh, but what they're learning is not stuff that, that maps necessarily to what we would assume that they're learning. Uh, and so, you know, there's this episode of Star Trek The Next Generation called Darmok where they kind of play around with this notion of uh, the limitations of a universal translator, right? Uh, they can talk to this group, it can, the universal translator can translate the words, but because, because this culture speaks in metaphor, uh, you know, what you get back, and because you don't have that context, again, to your point earlier, you can't actually understand what they're trying to say. Uh, in my mind, this is probably more of what they would have encountered uh, as they're uh, exploring space. 
Uh, and it, but it was a great episode, kind of diving into this idea. But I think if you keep in mind that what we're dealing with is not an artificial intelligence, I mean, it's obviously artificial, but it's really an alien intelligence. And if you assume or, 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 or quit assuming that it thinks like we do or learns like we do and maybe uses what it's learned uh, to arrive at a different set of conclusions we might than we might, uh, I think a lot of what neural networks don't do well will be clear. Okay, so before I jump into this, I also want to just uh, point out one other thing that I think is interesting. When you talk about image recognition, and we're going to talk a lot about image rec recognition through this next piece, state-of-the-art neural networks right now easily beat humans in terms of their ability to recognize what's in an image. Uh, human accuracy at, at uh, image recognition tasks is around 5%. Uh, the best neural networks right now are about 2.5% uh, uh, error rate. Uh, so they're about twice as good as humans are. And when I say good, I mean they're not just dis distinguishing between a dog and a cat. They can tell you what uh, out of a hundred different dog breeds that dog is. And then they can do that for horses uh, and in a bunch of other categories. So they, they very definitely outperform the best humans right now. But even though they do that, they still have some really crazy weaknesses, and you can exploit those weaknesses, uh, at least currently, uh, to make them do things uh, that uh, aren't really what you intend. So this is actually somewhat older research. It's a few years old now. Uh, but they introduced this idea of an adversarial example or an adversarial input. Okay, And the concept here is pretty simple. You take an image that we recognize. So any, everybody here knows what this is, a picture of a panda, right? And the neural network that, that is looking at it uh, says, yeah, this is a panda, and I'm about 57.7% confident that it's a panda. And you take that image, and you mix in some noise. So in this particular case, this noise that you mix in, uh, it's a basically a random pattern, but the neural network thinks, you know, with about 8.2% uh, confidence, it's a nematode. It's really irrelevant, but it's kind of funny. Uh, and what you get, what do you see? You see a panda, right? Unambiguously, this is a panda. It's the same picture uh, for all practical purposes to us. But this neural network is now very convinced, very, very convinced, it's a picture of a gibbon. And the point here, and, and this is not, so this is older research, but this, this is a pattern that exists with the software today. Uh, and and it's, it's because when these are, they're trained, they learn to recognize features. And in our mind, you recognize furry and two eyes and kind of a nose and some ears and this pattern of red and, I mean, white and black. And you go, ah, panda. Uh, but, and it's, rec it's learning features as well, but the features it's learning don't necessarily correspond to the ones we do. Now, I don't know what set of features in this makes it think it thinks it's a gibbon, but it's clearly, you know, looking at those in a different way than we do. So anyway, this kind of is another little takeaway and it plays, it's part of the game that we're going to play in all of these attacks that I'm going to talk about in a second. But before we do that, we're going to play a game called What Does This Sign Mean? So this should be easier than name that celebrity like, yeah, that's right. So this is, this is a sign you'd probably see anywhere. How about this one? Yeah, mowing next. No, what's interesting about this sign uh, is that you might see this uh, alongside any road leading outside, uh, you know, heading out of Atlanta. Uh, but it's sitting on the ground, right? It's not a permanent sign. It's not on a pole, but it's still a sign. And as a driver, you should uh, respect that sign. What is this sign telling us to do? Right, right. So, yeah, so this sign is a sign on top of another sign. Uh, but if you're driving along, the expectation is of, a dr of, of you as a driver is that you're going to, you know, obviously ignore what is covered up by this closed thing and maybe not try to take that exit. How about this sign? So this one, uh, this one has very, oh, it has words on it, next four miles. But the gist of the sign isn't conveyed in words at all. It's conveyed in an image. Uh, and then this one, what, do you, what, what, what are you supposed to do here? Yes, so that's exactly right. The expectation when you see this sign is that you should stop. You ignore the graffiti on this sign. Uh, you understand, and this goes back to the, the question of context that we talked about earlier, uh, or the question, yeah, that, that was brought up earlier. Once again, we bring to bear more than, uh, uh, quite a bit in inter interpreting these. And I, and I 
played this game to make a point. When you start to think about autonomous vehicles, the kind of the table stakes for autonomous vehicles are interpreting and understanding signs. So there are hundreds of signs uh, in common use in the United States. There are some guidelines for them, uh, and there's a lot of stuff that's uh, kind of ad hoc and not, not even well defined. Understanding signs, however, is table stakes. You can't even build a database and say, well, you know what, we'll just ignore what the signs are and we'll program this big database with every sign that's in existence on a stretch of road. Uh, you have to be able to interpret them. So a re realistic venue of attack, if you're thinking about autonomous vehicles, would be t attacking their ability to recognize signs. And in fact, that's a, a big, big, big area right now uh, with a lot of back and forth about what constitutes uh, how the, the magnitude of this threat. So let's watch another video. Uh, this is showing two uh, experiments that this group uh, in the Bay Area ran. Uh, with uh, an attempt to interpret this sign. They're just doing simple visual classification. This is maybe two years old, and then I'm going to show you another one after this where they actually do uh, some object detection as well. So pay attention. The bottom, right when I play this, is going to show you what the network uh, thinks it's seeing. Okay, so you saw at the very end on the, the left hand side. Uh, it thought it was a speed sign of some kind, and then I'll flip back and forth between speed limit and stop uh, while that was, was playing. I'm going to pull out one frame here, uh, which I hope you can see on the left-hand side. What they've got is a stop sign, and it doesn't even have as much graffiti on it as that one that said stop shopping. It's actually got some black and white tape on it. And once again, this is only a couple years old, but in uh, kind of AI terms, a couple years is, is ancient history right now. Uh, but I think it's still good. And so what they're basically showing is that you can defeat uh, the network that's actually trying to recognize signs with something as simple as tape. And this is important, right? If you take a sign and the only way you can defeat the recognition is by like blowing the sign away or covering it up, and we're going to talk about facial recognition toward the end. If you can only defeat these tools by completely obliterating all infor information on that sign, then, you know, it's of limited use, right? The thing that's important here is a couple pieces of tape. The average person looking at that's not going to understand that that sign has even been hacked. Uh, and yet the, the car that's looking at it is going to have a difficult time with it. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play another version. This is actually slightly more realistic, or more recent, I mean, uh, by the same group. So this one, they're actually doing object detection. So they're not just looking at a single thing in the scene. They're doing what a normal car would have to do, which is look at a lot of things, people and signs and dogs and trees and try to decide what's going on. Now this one is humorous because what do you see in the big purple thing over on the left? What does it think it's looking at? A train. So back to the question about context. You and I know that in an office building you're unlikely to see a train. Uh, and, and this highlights kind of one of the weaknesses. Now what's interesting is if you look at it, well, that's kind of train-like. And in fact, if a human said, you know, the row of windows went down one side of the, the hallway like a train, you'd go, oh, that's a beautiful metaphor, right? The, we're dealing with an alien intelligence again. It's not a metaphor in this particular case. It literally can't tell the difference. Uh, so it's, it's uh, give you once again a sense. Now this is, is relatively recent, but it's, a, it's the same type of thing. They're going to hack the sign uh, to make it hard for this thing to actually know, to tell that it's looking at a sign. Okay, so finally at the end, toward the end, it actually gets a sense that, okay, I'm actually looking at a sign there despite some of the other stuff on that sign. And realize, you can, you can make an argument that, oh, you know, you're, you know, how can you expect a car to deal with, you know, someone painting over a sign? Well, the practical side is, is graffiti on signs this is actually very common. When you leave here today or this weekend and, and head back, if you're driving, pay attention, or tonight, when you're driving, pay attention to the number of signs that have been, been vandalized, right? It's not an uncommon thing uh, despite the fact that you're not supposed to do it. So what's interesting about this is that it gets the person, the bottom half of the person, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and in this particular case, they're not using tape. What they've got is little weird shapes. I think they're bottles. And in fact, it manages to pick out the bottles on there uh, and not recognize that it's actually looking at a stop sign at all. Okay? So this type of research uh, you know, kicks off kind of an interesting dialogue between people that are working on autonomous vehicles and people that are working on identifying the weaknesses in these. And one of those is around, well, you know, if you're driving, you can actually see this thing from multiple directions. And 
you know, he's got to handle a broader set of lighting conditions or whatever, so these things would be much harder to pull off. So the most recent research is from this year, and this group decided we're just going to call, call this what it is. Uh, we are <laughs> building attacks on autonomous vehicles uh, with, uh, by, by hacking signs. And this actually goes back all the way to what I introduced this section on, which was this concept of adversarial examples. Because what they've done, if you look at the very top row, is they've taken a KFC logo, uh, which the network thinks might be what is that? Uh, bicycle crossing, yeah, with some small degree of confidence. It mixes that thing in with some stuff. Uh, and now the network is actually convinced that this thing is a stop sign. Uh, where you can see what a real stop sign looks like over there. Uh, and this is actually very, very recent. And they've got a video as well that's available. In this particular case, what they're, they're playing around with is your ability to identify what a speed limit actually is given a sign. Uh, and you can see as this thing plays, uh, it thinks that the speed limit's maybe 30 kilometers per hour when it's more like 100 and something. Uh, probably not going to be 120 kilometers per hour in that parking lot, but, but whatever. Uh, yeah, and once again, just to give you a, a sense of what they're doing, they've got a normal traffic sign. Uh, normally, the car would run this through the neural network classifier and find the correct speed, because it's not enough to just notice that there's a sign there like a stop sign. Some signs actually have information you have to pull out as well. Uh, and then they demonstrate, and I'll zoom into this on the bottom, what this looks like, you know, with some small modifications, once again, it's enough to confuse it uh, as to what it actually is. So that's autonomous vehicles. Uh, that is an area where a lot of companies are spending a lot of money right now trying to really push the, the frontier forward. Uh, here's another area where a, a number of big companies are trying to push the frontier forward as well. Uh, this is the area of kind of virtual assistance of various kinds. And I grabbed the logos of the four or five or six biggest, uh, uh, biggest vendors of that, Google and Alexa and whatever here. So we're going to talk a little bit uh, now about adversarial examples targeted at speech, okay, speech recognition in particular. And what's interesting is this, they do the exact same thing here, uh, in, uh, do the exact same thing here, except instead of two dimensions, which would be an image, we're really doing it one, with one dimensional signal data. But we're taking a signal here that the neural network and you and I would recognize as saying it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. They're mixing in some distortion to that. You and I would not pick that distortion up. We're going to process it out. Uh, however, the neural network now thinks it, this is a truth universally acknowledged, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so it's a very similar type of attack that we were talking about before, but now tar targeting audio. Uh, and it just occurred to me that uh, this part does have audio. I'm just going to flip this around and apologize. Maybe you can't all hear it, but I'll crank up the uh, mic. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you can hear it, uh, and you can maybe detect that there's possibly some distortion in there, but it's basically saying, okay, Google, browse to evil.com. So despite what you heard, uh, the thing that the, and they're actually using uh, a Mozilla toolkit at this point that they're testing this on. Oh. That's right. They're uh, using a Mozilla toolkit uh, that they're uh, targeting for this particular example. Uh, not uh, Alexa or Google or whatever, but you know, once again, we're talking about very similar technology under the covers. Uh, so here's what it actually sounds like unadulterated. Without a data set, the article is useless. And of course, this one recognizes without the data set, the article is useless. And what they did is uh, they do, have done the same exact thing uh, with music as well. So anyone want to guess what the command hidden in there was? Speech can be embedded in music. So uh, the, the uh, uh, Mozilla uh, Deep Speech Toolkit would actually recognize that as words, uh, even though you know, you'd be hard pressed to pick that out yourself. And here's, here's what it sounds like unadulterated. All right, little snippet of Bach. All right, so go back to kind of looking at the threat side of it. Uh, I didn't target uh, or talk about this so much with autonomous vehicles. 
Uh, that is an area that's moving so fast uh, that other than, you know, doing the, the, the research on it, you're going to have a hard time. Uh, they're just not in common use, so you're going to have a hard time uh, doing anything with that. Uh, but I think for this particular one, it's actually worth diving in a little bit and talking about what it takes to do this. So what you need is a pre-trained model, and you can actually download these right off of GitHub. So someone's al already trained this on a whole bunch of words and phrases, and it can, it can handle the speech uh, translation. You need the code, which you can get off GitHub. Uh, and these are really inexpensive to run. Uh, you're talking about under $10 if you run it, want to run it on top of Amazon AWS. It's a few hours at most, maybe a day of training uh, to do this. Now, with all that said, my take on it is that, uh, that, that we're all being a bit premature. The number one thing in my mind that you want as a feature for any kind of virtual assistant is to know that I'm actually there when I'm saying the command that you're trying to interpret. And as near as I can tell right now, they all fail poorly uh, with this particular problem. And so I'm going to go ahead uh, and play my simple hack uh, on an Amazon Alexa. How can you find where you dropped an omelet? Eggs marks the spot. So aside from the sad humor there, that was me recording my voice uh, on the phone, uh, on my phone, and then playing that command back. And Alexa, obviously, uh, in, unable to distinguish between a recording of my voice and my voice. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but to me, it, uh, this proximity, the notion, once again, of this context notion that the person speaking is the one that's giving the command to me is the core of any kind of assistant that you'd actually want. Uh, and, and, and most of them, at least the ones that I've spent any time uh, looking at, all struggle with that basic concept. So whether you can, can, can embed uh, commands in the audio is maybe even a, you know, a little bit beyond where we're, we need to even be right now. But I think it's worth asking the question, are adversarial examples always a bad thing? And I'm going to make the case that despite uh, some of the things that maybe made you a little bit nervous about autonomous vehicles and, and uh, virtual assistants, in fact, maybe it's not always bad. Uh, this is some interesting research on defeating facial recognition, uh, which uh, you know you may not be a, a, as big of a fan of, a, of as a virtual assistant. So what's really fun about this particular research is they actually built physical glasses. And I'll show you a picture of that in a second. And what they've done is by putting these glasses on, by training the network, once again, on a data set of celebrity faces, uh, and then wearing these glasses, you can actually fool uh, some facial recognition technology uh, simply by wearing them. Uh, and so you can see here uh, uh, Mila Jovovich is, is the, the actress that they think the person above is actually uh, when, they, when they've got these glasses on. Uh, same exact thing across the board, right? And, and this is important because once again, I'm going to talk about this. If you're talking about facial defeating some of these technologies, you, you don't want to be obvious about it, right? Here, someone's walking around with glasses. Uh, you know, how bad can that be? They're obviously not trying to do anything bad. And this is just a close-up of these actual glasses. They, like, print these out on an inkjet printer, stick them on the pair of glasses, and yet that's enough to fool uh, common facial recognition toolkits. So what's required to do this? A uh, pre-trained model, which you can download again, a bunch of celebrity faces, uh, which you can obviously download, uh, the code, which you can download, and once again, about $10 is pretty straightforward. And you need an inkjet printer and some things like that, uh, and you can actually pull this off. I want to highlight one other thing very quickly, uh, and then we'll go back to questions. There's a site out called CV Dazzle, which is focused on, so let me back up. If you're going to tackle facial recognition and try to subvert it, obviously, you can just wear a mask over your face, right? That'll take care of all, all, any facial recognition on the planet. The problem is uh, it's obvious, right? And in some jurisdictions, you can't even wear a mask over your face. So what they're trying to do in this site is create a fashion style that, that baffles image recognition or facial recognition, but doesn't necessarily look like that's what it's trying to do. And it's interesting to read, because things like obscuring the bridge of your nose, which is a common landmark that these toolkits use, uh, is enough to throw off their ability to even tell that they're looking at a face, for instance. Uh, so I just throw this up because it's kind of interesting. And then I just want to th throw out one idea, too. If we really want to go for it, uh, you know, maybe we can just uh, adopt something like this where uh, everyone is just dressed crazy. Uh, and, uh, you know, good luck recognizing anybody uh, in, in most of that crowd as far as I'm uh, concerned. So with that said, I just want to share a link uh, right here. This is to uh, Mastodon instance I've set up uh, where I've got uh, links to all of the stuff that I listed there. 
Um, and uh, I've got a kind of a condensed version of the PDF as well uh, that you can download from there. And, and basically, I'm free for questions uh, for anyone that's got those. So typically, the attacks seem to involve adding additional information, which confuses the system. On the flip side, you have more of like a transfer learning, where you take a subset of the learning and apply it to a different domain, which humans are typically good at, and AI not so much. Where do you see the research on this? So that's actually that's an interesting one. I don't know if I've got a good opinion about that one right now. Uh, you have to think about that. I don't have a I don't have a good ready ins answer for that. Transfer learning, so that everyone is aware, is you take a trained model that's been trained in one area. And then without having to retrain it from scratch, you potentially use it in another domain uh, to save some training time, et cetera. Uh, can you talk about bias in the training material, whether it's intentional or unintentionally introduced? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I thought about addressing it, but people have been talking about, people are starting to talk about bias more. Uh, so I thought I'd focus in some other areas. I actually think bias is a huge problem uh, for this whole area because it just goes without saying. If you train one of these things, this is garbage in, garbage out, or bias in, bias out, right? If you take a biased training set and train a, a network on it, it's going to make biased predictions off of that, right? So bias is a huge problem. And it's a huge problem because I think people are unaware of how, uh, how much bias exists in almost any system that we've got, in almost any data set that we've got. Uh, Luckily, I think people are starting to pay a little more attention to it. It's actually, in terms of weaknesses, I think it's actually potentially one of the big weaknesses of this whole approach to solving problems, uh, because you need to really start with solid, unbiased data if you want your system to not amplify that bias as it's making predictions. Um, oh, do I stand? Um, uh, adversarial examples actually have an interesting history in. Um, uh, specifically targeting machine learning actually in spam and spam mitigation, uh, which is a weird little tidbit, but the, uh, there seems to be two types of uh, attacks. Those that occur uh, more of evasion attacks, right, after the model's been trained. Um, but there's also another subset that, um, not, that came a little late, but I'm not sure you covered, of uh, affecting the actual training of the model so that it could misclassify, specifically for linear regression where um, you can have where the input is just numbers, so they're much more easier to skew and affect. Um, have you seen any kind of research take those approaches of uh, misidentifying the training model and then seeing how far things can be skewed? Yeah, I mean, I haven't definitely haven't put anything uh, in terms of the preparation for this talk in that area. I mean, that's an interesting area too. Part of what I was trying to do was pick a few things that I could explain well. So there's, a, there's actually a lot of, of uh, depth in this particular area. Uh, the, the links that I provide are maybe a good starting, off, starting point. Uh, good luck uh, staying up on top of all of the reading, uh, because there are about 100 papers published every day, I swear, uh, in this area. Was there any place that this type of uh, AI interpretation is getting used in like the medical community for something that might be uh, difficult or a special skill set like x-ray interpretation or overall looking at all patient information taking in data and going hey this what might be going on I mean there are two areas that I, I guess that pop to mind uh, that I'm aware of or at least aware enough to say anything about uh, one obviously in in radiology or imaging in general uh, there's been a strong desire for probably 20 plus years to automate the process of interpreting images right uh, it's, a, it's, it's challenging, it's expensive, uh, and there's a strong feeling that that should be something that could be done better with a machine. I think uh, for a variety of reasons, we're probably only at the point of, of kind of assisted uh, identification at this point. Uh, but I'm, I'm actually fairly convinced. Uh, to me, interpreting a radiological image is basically pattern matching. Uh, and that is, at, you know, if you have enough data, if you've got enough priors for that particular patient, you know, that to me is, is the kind of thing that this does eminently well. Uh, I think it'll be a while before it replaces radiologists. Uh, the other area I would say is looking at uh, various signals inside of a hospital and looking for infection outbreaks, for instance, uh, you know, identifying patterns that, uh, you know, are, are 
you know, where you're, you're, you're looking at you know, things going on inside the hospital, you're looking at those signals and you're trying to find problems. Like in this particular ward, uh, we may have a problem with an infection breaking out so we can take some proactive, notification, uh, to, uh, proactive steps to deal with that. Those are the only two that I've got and I can glibly say anything about. So in light of the fragility of these systems and the high efficacy of the attacks that are possible, uh, what industry or what application do you think this hammer will suddenly not have nails everywhere? Where will it be abandoned? Where will, it, a, where will it be abandoned? Yeah. Like hey, machine learning just isn't the way to do it for this application. Uh, I mean, I think in areas where we don't have enough data. So I'll, let me throw all my cards on the table uh, right now. I mean, I consider us to be proof examples of what you can achieve with machine learning. Uh, so that says a lot about where I sit and how I think about things. So I believe that anything we can do, we ultimately will be able to train a system to do. Uh, now, we can debate whether that's a good point of view. So I, I guess I view anything we could do as potentially something that could be done. But right now, where it sits, you need uh, a lot of data for most of these things. Uh, One-shot training where you take a small set of data, except in cases where you may be doing transfer learning or something like that, uh, is still problematic. So you need a lot of data. Areas where there's not a lot of data, where there are no inherent patterns, or where the patterns are inherently chaotic, like the stock market, uh, you're going to have problems. But then we'd have problems, too. Great. Um, so one of the things that we always have a problem with is um, in the initial time, everybody's trying to quickly uh, progress the technology and we kind of forget about security. How serious are people at authenticating the information that they're receiving to, to verify that this stop sign doesn't have tape on it or whatever? I mean, I would say that I probably can't address your questions straight on. I would say that my feeling is that like almost any other new technology, the amount of effort being spent thinking about the implications uh, is far uh, less than needs to be. Uh, so people should be spending a lot more time thinking about the security implications of this. It shouldn't be me pointing out that, that you really want to be able to identify the fact that the person giving a command is actually standing in front of the device. The fact that we have devices that don't do that in their first generation to me is problematic. Like who cares that they can recognize my voice and run some script in a server somewhere? I mean that's cute. but. Really, if you want a virtual assistant, the notion of assistant is that it can understand who's giving the command. So I think there's a huge gap still in terms of, of, of time spent really thinking about this. Some, you know, some, good in, in, some people are at least paying attention to this uh, now, but I think it's going to be entertaining for a while. Or entertaining is my euphemism for probably horrible. But uh, So I had a question. Um, with each of these individual networks that set up, they undergo specific sorts of training to be able to see specific sorts of pattern. Um, say you had multiple people deploying facial recognition without knowing what kind of training that they've gotten into, is there any sort of like generalized thwarting effort that would be like the random nematode pattern? Do those sorts of thwarting efforts have to also be trained against specific training regimens or are they typically like universally effective? Are you asking if you applied an ensemble of like a, a set of facial recognition approaches and use that in parallel to identify a person? Is there a particular uh, tool or approach that would defeat all of those? I mean, I think you can take that to some degree. Uh, so with facial recognition in particular, I think there's an understanding of how uh, these systems, generally speaking, uh, identify, first of all, that in terms of the whole big thing they're looking at, we're looking at a face, much less any particular person's face. Uh, and you can take advantage of that uh, to, uh, to defeat something in a general way. The problem, I think, is that it's, it's the, the level of specificity at this point, right? You're, you'll, you'll kind of have to take a sledgehammer-based approach to doing it, right? It's like, okay, let's, let's really obliterate chunks of my face uh, when maybe something more precise would have been sufficient just because you want to make sure you've taken out a big chunk. Uh, I actually don't know of any research that has looked at that, but then again, there's a lot of research and I don't have time to look at all of it, so. Okay. Thanks, everybody.